Hey kids, do you like professional wrestling? This week, AEW goes into the ECW member berries business itself. The Lazy River of Wrestling Criticism, Survivor Series, and Full Gear builds? Somewhat. An Invader Club, Vader and Great Kokita, aka Yokozuna versus Shinya Hashimoto and Masa Saito. From New Japan Pro Wrestling 1990, I am Jeff Hawkins. He is Chris Novembrino. You you look like you're about to say something, so go ahead. Oh God, I, this is this is a killer week, Jeff. I just can't wait to get into it. I actually I wasn't about to say anything at all, but I heard a breath. Your, I heard a no, breath. You're, I you're, you're, set, you're setting me up for a, a white hot tease of uh, great dazzling commentary that I have for this week's show. Uh, did you see the Mike Tyson fight? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Just a banner week for entertainment and sports, huh? I, I I didn't see a Mike Tyson fight. What I saw was, was Mike Tyson's ass. <laughs> I saw him stand around for the better part of ten minutes valiantly. Um, I I got in right as they were doing the interview with his son. That then turned into him turning around and then showing his ass to everybody. And I got oh, this is gonna be a fun little evening. Um, I enjoyed the best part of that whole thing was the interview he did with the child reporter. Oh, yes, I don't believe in legacy. <laughs> when we die, we're just dust. I I just love the kids' reaction. Well, I've never heard that perspective before. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, true pro, uh, true uh, pro from the child thing. Uh, the women's boxing match was decent. Um, that said, you want to hear a a mind-boggling statistic from that fight viewership because, uh well not exactly viewership it it, it relates I'll, I'll get to it in a second because it, it's odd because i was watching it through the prism of and I'm, I'm reading everybody having problems with buffering issues and i'm going wwe is going to need to have a little bit of a talk with netflix before they go live the first time although there won't be nearly this many people and Apparently, there won't be this many people watching an NFL game because apparently this thing did monster numbers. But uh, former Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver Antonio Bryant was live streaming it by pointing his phone to the uh, big Jumbotron in Jerry World. Seven and a half million viewers. (laughs) If you think Twitter is somehow ever going to truly truly die in any way uh yeah seven and a half million people watched through twitter through antonio bryant broadcasting it on his phone (laughs) which which is about 10x the number of viewers for aew and nxt but (laughs) uh it was just yeah and the fight itself was just i thought it was going to be a draw I thought they had worked it out to be a draw somehow, and I was going to be even more angry because, <laughs> no, it was not much of a fight. It was sad. I didn't want to watch a 57-year-old Mike Tyson, although there were flashes of old Mike in there. The body was, what is it, the mind was willing, but the body was weak. I, you just. I, I mean, the whole strategy was garbage for It, it Tyson. was. It was. He yeah. should have just gone in there and gone after him and worn right. himself I, out. I, I mean. I, I don't understand why he didn't go for broke in two rounds, especially with two minute rounds. Yes. Uh, the strategy was horrible. Like, pace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he was but, never a pace yourself fighter. Also, Twitter is down 30% usership overall since the Musk takeover. But I think you're right. It's I don't know that's going to drop below that. No, the, the thing is also, I mean, everybody, like, the big move right now for, like, journalists and stuff is they're going to Blue Sky, and that's going to end up, like, Mastodon, I think. They're, they arrive on this island and say, we're in charge, and the people who are already there are going to go, nope. <laughs> no, you know, I, I think, you, I mean, th- this sort of thing, it, I think Twitter will continue to lose shares. People will go and try things like Mastodons or Blue Skies or whatever, None of them will really take, and I think eventually some new platform will take over, um, but we still haven't arrived at that Blue yet. Sky is the big thing right now with the wrestling uh, media. A lot of people going over there. Uh, some finding out that it used to be the domain of a lot of uh, OnlyFans and other things. and oh. Finding out there's an unusual amount of hardcore pornography on the, <laughs> the Blue Sky. 
Uh, so we'll see how that some goes. people can find that a value added. Some do, especially some who watch wrestling. Yeah. Uh, um, light news week, but there are some things. Tony Khan made a deal with Guns N' Roses uh, to use the song November Rain to promote Full Gear. First video will air on Collision. It's probably already aired as we are taping on Saturday night. And there will be a video on Dynamite, and I presume also on the Full Gear Show. This is Dave Meltzer and the Wrestling Observer talking. The 1991 song, which was released in 2022, was used by Paul Heyman, unauthorized, every November to promote his annual November to Remember show, which was his big show of the year. So we had NXT getting into the ECW member berries, and now Tony Khan is getting into that business with this story and the next one as well. Um, any thoughts on this? Because I think, I think actually... You know, if you're gonna pay to use the song, it's it's not the worst idea in the world to, to kind of connect it to previous fandom and stuff like no, that. No, I, I don't. I don't even think it's a terrible wrestling rock song to have the rights to. I I just think that at a time where this company probably should be going through the books and looking at cost cutting measures. This seems to me to be like an unnecessary expense. I am pro music videos overall. Like I love the Watts cheese in mid South where you would just take, you know, and, and cut them. And the hype videos were always good. Like I remember Smoky mountain got me into a tag team called the wild bunch. Uh, which was Joel Deaton and I forget the name of the other guy, but, you know, from an all Japan run by doing born to be wild. And it was just highlights of them in, in all Japan doing various things. I mean, but I mean, if I were them, I'd, I kind of try and do what WWE did a little bit and they don't do so much now, but they kind of do it and, and find a, you know, use, use your Warner brothers connections and promote new artists. And and do music videos of your of your group there. I think that would be fantastic. But that of might course... even be more cost effective too. Uh, I I think to your point, Guns and Roses. I would be surprised. That if ask, they... that ass cap fee is is well. I'd be seven very surprised figures. on their social media that okay. they do any sort of promotion of the fact that AEW is using November Rain. Right. Maybe. Maybe. No, no, they yeah, won't. But, no, I think they would. Be, I would be. Sh- I would actually be surprised by that. Whereas, if you used a modern band and you had them appear at the pay per view, yes. you're now getting on all of their social medias, and you might be able to do that more cost effectively and increase visibility. I have so, no problem with them going the NXT poppy route because I mean, I don't. Um, I don't. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean. And it, you theoretically, you could find anyone, and they're more talented than Sexy Red. <laughs> Unnecessary. <laughs> Maybe it's necessary. I don't know. No, it's necessary. <laughs> you and keep I, showing up on my television, Jeffrey. <laughs> Gonna have to book that asteroid Sexy Red battle of the band. Yeah, no. It, 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 the Chris asteroids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's be, let's be clear. Uh, NXT attempted to book a date at the Hammerstein Ballroom to follow up on the 2300 Arena success. However, the date they wanted was close enough to the dates Tony Khan had booked for uh, <laughs> had booked where they had to say no. Andrew Zarian reporting that ROH Final Battle will take place on December 20th in the building and Collision on December 21st. The ECW nostalgia wars have come to have come to roost again, Chris. And and let me tell you, Rob Van Dam looks better than ever as we enter into these. How will we how will we find a way to get Tommy Dreamer away from Impact or TNA and to make never, an appearance? Never have I wanted to see these guys more than right now. So oh, this is, God. I'm, I'm just pumped. <laughs> No, but it is interesting that NXT and uh, that the that the wrestling war now is NXT and AEW. It yeah. really is in yeah. some ways because w- when this whole thing started five years back, it was all about AEW building up to take on the main roster, but settling for running NXT off, and now now it's a war between. AEW and the developmental and the developmental does do some stunt casting and some stunt things to try. (laughs) It's, it's kind of interesting, but it's still for, you know, about 700,000 people given a night. It it basically feels kind of like 
It's the WWE, nerd thing. It's for the big WWE nerd WWE is toying with AEW on the ratings, too. Like, if they really wanted to submarine them, yeah. they could bring in the big guns. It feels like playing with your food a little bit, you know, Yeah, right. You, 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 could just, <laughs> you could drop the bloodline in there, do some sort of dynamite angle on NXT, and everyone would be on that. And AEW would do 300,000. Speaking of which, the ratings were close, but AEW won this week. NXT on, on the 12th, back in its normal time slot, did 631,000 with a .16 in 18 to 49, .11 in 18 to 34. AEW Dynamite did, on, on the next night uh, did its best number since Grand Slam with 666,000 with a .22 in 18 to 49 and a .11 in 18 to 34. Uh I have no big thoughts on that. I just wanted to bring it up. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, and, and ending it, uh, some free agency news as uh, it came out yesterday, I believe this was. But uh, Speedball Mike Bailey, his contract has uh, run out in TNA. Mike Bailey's interesting in some ways. Have you ever seen Mike Bailey work? Man, I don't. If I have, it's been a long time. The, he used to do a Karate Kid gimmick. Back in the day in his 20s. And it was especially big when he was doing PWG and Reseda and doing a Karate Kid gimmick. Sure, there. sure. Um, could not work in the States for five years because he got caught uh, improperly using his visa to actually do uh, work. And he's from Canada. He's 34 and he's look, and it looks like he's probably gonna sign with AEW. And I'm gonna say at 34 and being five foot eight and not a terribly great, compelling promo, but a good work rate guy, he's gonna fit right in on on uh, Rampage for the last few weeks if it's on there or Collision. Or right, he's gonna be one of these guys who ends up in that Kyle O'Reilly level, you know, the uh, AR Fox. Leo Rush, small guys who can work, but and they're they're good on the roster. But you know, do you, do you, can you build them into stars? I don't know. I would say if he were if if he had signed with WWE about ten years ago, he would have been an NXT darling, and Vince would have crushed him on the main roster. So maybe maybe this is his big money run. I I don't know. It, it's it's an interesting case. I'm gonna be intrigued. Because he's not the strongest promo, but he has that indie cred, you know, that that people love. I, I just, it's one of those things where I just feel like it's going to be, hey, Speedball Mike Bailey versus Commander on Collision for 20 weeks in a row, or thereabouts. Of all of those kind of Collision Rampage level guys, the only one that I still think could break through a little bit would be a leo rush if he's yes. got his head on straight he he's got the personality and the charisma he still feels like he's got star power he's a guy you can probably turn on at any time and just yeah. have him cut a couple promos and he's off to the races yeah it just i just wonder if given the previous right the previous breakup if, if tony's ever gonna see him in that way and i i, just, I think he i think he may be part of this uh hurt uh syndicate thing sooner than later which will be good for him but i, I think also, so but i could also see him just being the job guy in the hurt syndicate which i don't think is is the best you know i mean he'll get a few wins he'll get wins over guys like you know some some one of the top flight kids who in a singles match or something like that but never you know a big thing but i think you're correct on that um now the lazy river of wrestling criticism where we whatever we watched whatever we had time for uh chris i my plans on this, I have all the segments for AEW Dynamite written down. Yeah. And I'm doing a thir- going to do a thorough deconstruction of why this show just seemed to miss with the crowd in some ways. Um, no, let, let's, so let's, let's do let's, it. Because do we want to thought... do that first or do we want to get our no, WWE let, stuff out let's of Let's do it because I, I, I thought this show was, was very flat, so I'm interested to kind of hear you. I was, I, man, flat was the right word for it. And uh, I do a show that basically deconstructs this entire thing for, a, for an hour or so. We, we go about 20 minutes, and we both were like, God, this is a flat show. And the crowd seemed to think it was a flat show too. So we open with Christian Cage and Hangman making separate entrances 
for their opening bout against Juice Robinson and Switchblade Jay White. Now, Chris, do you know why this match happened? Because Cage and Page rhyme as last names? I like <laughs> legitimately don't know why this happened. No, it was because three weeks or so, uh, uh, Switchblade said that there were two guys that he had to get revenge on. And these were the two guys that, that, that had beat him down, I believe, at that time. Now, this could have been solved very easily by doing possibly like... You remember, you remember when Collision used to do the Saturday Night Main Event opening and you'd have promos from each guy in the match? Yeah. You could have had a nice, quick, short promo or an inset during these things where Cage and Page tell you, oh... Jay White, Jay White called us out. Well, we're going to put our differences aside to team up against you guys this week, as opposed to, I think maybe Excalibur may have said in passing had referred to this promo that Jay White did in, in, in ring beforehand. But especially if you're someone like me who has this on while you're cleaning the house. And so, especially when people are walking to the ring or whatever, you're not catching every bit of dialogue, dude, you got to clob me over the head with this story. Yes, I would agree. And this was a grudge match that was not worked as a grudge match. It was just a match. And I, I, I hate that. It seemed more like Paige and Cage fighting with one another and yes. not getting along was actually the crux of the story. Yes, we have heels who don't get along. Can they coexist? And then they win. <laughs> I just, I just, I just went, God, and it just seemed like there was no emotion in this match, and that will be a recurring theme throughout this show. Next, Mercedes Monet promo, where it ends, you know, in a very well timed stunt. I thought where where Camille comes out of the room and gets speared through the wall. That part was great. Here's the part I don't like. Mercedes is trying that whole rock thing from back in the Attitude Era with Kevin Kelly or Jonathan Coachman, where she's a heel. But she, and we went over this last week with the Hurt Syndicate in many ways. We have to get the baby face pop out of it first, where where she says the name of the city and say hello to your CEO before then going into heel shtick. And I think this is the wrong approach because it sends a mixed message. I think your heels should just be heels as opposed to as I believe Jim Cornette used to call it, the NWO cool heel thing where, you know, you have to come out and be the cool guy, but you're still the bad guy, but you're still getting baby face pops. Well, yeah, and, and the worst part about the cool heel thing, and I think Cornette, like, rightly identified, is that there's no way for a cool heel to show ass. Yes. Because it flies firmly in the face of the characterization of the cool heel. I mean... The whole point of the cool heel is for the baby face who is actually cool to come out and show that the cool heel is not as cool as he thinks he is. But if you don't have cool or baby, like this is actually why Sting was a saving grace, right? Yes. He was actually a cool baby face who was cooler than the heels who thought they were cool, but like Sting was really cool. Yeah, and they made and he made them look like idiots all the yes. time. So that so that yeah. helped. Yeah, and yeah. then and then I, 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 I think the Mercedes trying to get heat by abusing Camille. It's just a bad move in so many ways, unless we're going to start teaming Statlander and Camille as some sort of twin towers or something like that. Uh, I right. Just... I, I mean, would it, Hunter and China have been a better dynamic if Hunter was constantly telling China she can't get the job done? Yes. I don't think so. I know. It's it just... Right? Like, is Shawn Michaels and Diesel a better dynamic if Shawn Michaels is constantly mad at Diesel? I don't think so. Unless you're building to Diesel power bombing Shawn Michaels and Camille as this white hot baby face is a bad idea for anyone who thinks it's a good idea. No, and it's never going to get there either because also the relationship has not been long enough where we care that much about Camille. I mean, this should have been a year long thing of Camille accidentally screwing things up for Mercedes before Mercedes just said, I've had enough of this versus. Well or conversely, Camille trying her best to save things, and yes. it's never good enough for Mercedes. Yes, and yeah. Mercedes kind of keeps humiliating Camille. I mean, like the the tone is wrong here, right? Like uh -huh. Mercedes should really be telling Camille that she's got big muscles, but she's you know not very smart, 
Yes. Uh, yeah, and that like she doesn't really understand how to wrestle, and like, like ba- you know, basically like kind of belittling her. And then it gets to the, that 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 you remember. You're not a star. This you is don't such have an, the star power. You don't look like a star. This You're is such an old enough. movie. This is such an old yeah. movie, but uh, the Running Man, where there's that moment where uh, Richard Dawson's Gillian looks and goes, "What's the matter? Steroids rot your brain or something?" And then it's like, "Ooh, <laughs> shouldn't have said that." Kind of a thing. Yeah, it, it needs to lead to. It needs to lead to that psychic break, and it's it's just not because it hasn't been a long enough relationship, and we're not we're not invested. Speaking of which, we then get Tony Schiavone interviewing Will Ospreay, and then Will dismisses Tony, and Kyle Fletcher comes out, and this is the definition to me, and this is what I brought up Wednesday. Uh, and I'm gonna. I'm sorry if you hate me using acting or improv type of things. This is a negotiation scene where we have two people who are saying words and they're not listening to each other and they're just giving exposition and they've both picked the wrong emotion and any other emotion and any emotional reaction to anything the other guy says would give this feud some form of depth, but they don't. Instead, we get Fletcher playing cocksure heel with no Don Callis around him we have Will Ospreay playing stoic, which means he's not going to show any emotion. And we have him invoking his kid. You came over to my house and took care of my kid. And then my kid grabbed my arm and I couldn't feel it. But none of this is having any emotional resonance whatsoever with either player on there. Um, there's no real anger for Will Ospreay towards Kyle Fletcher, nor towards Fletcher towards Ospreay. Nor no, is there no... a point where Ospreay breaks through Fletcher's veneer yes. and like momentarily yes. reaches it. L- like Fletcher isn't a strong enough actor to carry this, and neither is Osprey. There's no, there's no internal struggle about this lifelong friendship or whatever that that's now going to be thrown away in this match. There's no desperation kind of in Fletcher that's saying I'm so sick of being compared to you, kind of a thing where that you get sometimes where the little brother syndrome type of a thing where you can just feel the anger of always being compared to Will Ospreay, any, and just listen to each other and react to the lines given, but instead they're just rushing through their lines like it's a script, and there's no emotional connection to the words whatsoever, whereas if they had slowed down just a little bit, and if they had heard the words and actually reacted to it, this this feud would be so much money, because everybody wants to see this match, and it's just there's no... It was just an exposition scene. It was remember when. Remember when I came to your house and blah, 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 blah. It, it, it's another one of those. We, we've brought this up before. It's like, how many years have we known each other <laughs> kind of a thing? It's like, well, I should know how many years you know each other by the way you talk to each other. And I, there was none of that here. I I actually had a moment when watching this promo of... You know what people who are actually friends for a long time never say to one another? You know, Jeff, we've been friends for many years. <laughs> yes. Because it's like, well, no shit, Sherlock. Like, yeah, duh. Yeah, duh, right. You don't have to tell me. There, yeah, no, no. This, this is a big thing in, in unscripted uh, art form where, where, where it's like you're, you're afraid to, to have a relationship, so you say what the relationship is. Right? It's like, how many years have we known each other? 20? It's like, well, I mean, who who starts a conversation like that? Right? Right? Yeah. That's just not an organic way of conversing. So the whole thing feels stilted. The appeal to the kid is lazy writing and also is kind of a bit of an emotional tightrope walk because if you don't land the emotional notes on this, it's just like me going... But Jeff, I have a kid, but <laughs> you don't understand. I have a kid. Yes, it's a theoretical I, child. I ha- it's not right, one that you I, have an emotional connection to either. It's like, what about my little son? But what about Blankenburg? my child? Yes. I who have. I love. I have a child who is a plot point in this story I'm telling you right now, so you should feel shame. I, I want to do this, but also I have to think about the child that I love. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the tiger driver is that scary to him, 
he should actually get a little emotional talking about his kid grabbing his arm that he can't feel anymore. But, you know, it, it was just one of those things where nobody was connecting emotionally with either's material. Or, or, or how about Osprey going, my son asked me, are you going to hit the tiger driver on Uncle Kyle? Yes. And I had to look him in the eye and go, I'm going to do whatever it takes to stop Uncle Kyle. Yes, you know, go into the... I mean, Uncle look, Kyle is not the man that I chose to make your uncle. They're, they're, uncle Kyle is a stranger to me now. There are people here who are yelling at whatever audio device they're listening to and say, I don't watch wrestling for the acting or bad melodrama that, that, or whatever. That don't bring up Uncle Kyle. Don't. I mean, they didn't say Uncle Kyle, but don't bring up your son then. But, I guess yes. we're just having a match to see who does the best arm drags. Yes, and, 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 and there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the professional wrestling art form on television. If, Everyone if you, compares my arm drags to you, Will Ospreay, but I do the best arm drags. <laughs> and when I hit you with the drop toe hold, follow it up with an arm drag and a headlock takeover at the November pay-per-view. We'll know who's the best in terms of raw technical execution and entertaining the fans. Pip, pip, it'll be a five-star classic. Uh, yeah. We'll uh, see what Mr. Meltzer has to say about me after this <laughs> match, Will Ospreay. I can't do it any better than that. That was that was a phenomenal promo. That that's the kind of thing. Yes. We will see. We will go to battle and we will see who who's a oh yeah, it's just like oh god, whatever. Uh, uh all the rotations on your high flying moves have always been substandard. My finishes look crisper and I work safer. Will Osprey, you do not have a chance against me at the upcoming pay-per-view. <laughs> Oh, uh, we go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was fantastic. I need to clip that. Uh, Lance Archer and Roddy Strong. Nobody cares about the Undisputed Kingdom. If they get killed by the Don Callis family, <laughs> the the whole Roddy Strong getting into the match that we want to see with MJF and and Adam Cole. It's ridiculous on its face because everybody's expecting Roddy to turn on Adam Cole at some point anyways. Ziggy and Zaggy to get into this match is like, who? I would call this too clever by half, but who is this clever for? I don't know, but I, I absolutely love the spot where he and Taven have to stand up on that rail while we're waiting for the security guards to, who have missed their cue to run in so that we can safely slam Matt Taven onto a couple of local indie talent guys i just i'm like okay cool whatever and that bled into Takeshita and cole adam cole and we had to play adam cole's music until the audience got a chance to go boom which was ridiculous adam cole looked so tiny in there against Takeshita. Uh, and the story he was, he was never a big guy but i feel like he's lost size and for him, it's the difference between being credible and just being a guy who really should be a GM. And we're and we're doing an for what I for lack of a better term, I call an indie match. They're they're doing everything smooth, but they're doing all the hits. And the story here is that Adam Cole should be desperate to get into the match with MJF, but he's getting foiled because of the size difference and because Takesh is a damn killer. Oh, I'll go one step further. The story should be that Adam Cole is getting foiled by Takesh and then he has to tap into the evil side. That's, that, I, that's where that, I was going, but yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he has to tap into the evil side that he told us he needed to become to retcon the yes. whole... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I need to get into a match with the devil. I need to become the devil again. Just this little time right here. And it's always there. It's always lurking. I, yes. I, I, and, but like, and it, it, need, it needed to be like a blatant spot. He distracts the ref and then hits Takeshita in the leg with a steel chair. Yes. It, 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 I mean, like something absolutely like over the top and blatant and just like, I'll do whatever it takes. And then that becomes a point of friction between Roddy and Cole, where Roddy's like, well, I'm in this match too, but I didn't need to hit somebody with a steel chair to get into this match. Adam. Well, well, but, but there was a fall. It was a false count anywhere match, his match with Archer. And he, he attacked Archer with the kendo stick. Right. See, so we already know he's willing to do that. And so this, uh, all but that's not illegal in a false count. No, anywhere. I agree. I agree. Right. So, so that's not even unscrupulous. No, I, I get that. But, but this is all to get to, the Kyle O'Reilly, Cole, Roddy thing, 
where Roddy has already turned on Kyle O'Reilly with the rest of the kingdom. Adam Cole's turned on everybody three different times, and we're supposed to remember all this. And it's just, to me, I don't know what we're doing Wednesday, but it for some reason it feels like Cole versus Roddy to get into the match with MJF, or Kyle O'Reilly versus Cole to get in for MJF. This is going to become Adam Cole has to find a way to get into the match, and he can't, I think. I don't know. Maybe, maybe because Roddy versus MJF, eh. <laughs> Who cares? It's at least a fresh match, but who cares? Yeah, it's one of those things where it's I think... It's a fresh match for collision. Well, well, well. everybody's saying, well, no, you do you do Roddy and MJF for uh, Full Gear, and then you do Cole versus MJF for the next pay-per-view, and I'm just like, so you have to continue this whole thing for another few months, and it's oh. dull, and it's, it's not very interesting, and MJF <laughs> filmed his vignettes, obviously, in one week, to, so he could do his movie. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, yeah. And, and none of these things, by the way, interact with each other. They're all their own fiefdoms, which makes this next one interesting because now we get the death riders and we've been told that, that, uh, John Moxley is going to take over the super station. All right. What does that look like? It looks like a promo. Yeah, it looks like a segment. And also they beat up J.D. Vance, or not J.D. Vance. Uh, J.D. Drake. J.D. Drake. J.D. Drake, JD Drake who, who, for no reason, because apparently he was scheduled to fight tonight, but judging that there were 15 segments already announced for this show, I'm struggling to find where he was supposed to be competing. But nevertheless, right. I, liked, I liked Moxley's promo. Don't get me wrong. It's just... Right. No, if you're going to have J.D. Drake... As, you know, like the MacGuffin here, at least tease earlier, like you do something like J.D. Drake does a promo about his match later tonight yes. where he gets a number one contender shot. I have a big opportunity. At, I'm not I usually on television. This is this is exciting for me. I can't wait to get out there. I can't. Yes. I, yes. I want to win the uh, international title or whatever their mid-card title is, one of the 18 mid-card titles they got. This is a chance for me to get on TV, become a number one contender shot, and get myself on the map. And then the Death Riders annihilate him. Yes, you 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 give some pretext to what's going to happen and why he's there. Okay, Because cool. I don't care when he gets annihilated, and that's no. the problem. I don't care. Yeah, okay, so Moxley delivers a great pay-per-view, or a great promo don't get me wrong he was angry so he brought some emotion to it i liked that but nobody in this world is affected by moxley and his crew other than the people that they're currently feuding with and by the way i think marina shafir is a mcguffin too <laughs> i don't understand her whole role in this but she's there so we get orange cassie he comes out with his i mean and he is also not showing any emotion but that's his gimmick and i can forgive that but, and it kind of works with what Moxley's like. What makes him so pissed off is that that he can't yes. get a rise out of Cassidy. Yes. So I like that Cassidy's internalized that. Yes, but we've also now taken away the heat from Orange because we have Darby Allen jumping from great heights onto this crew, <laughs> and not just that. Then they ruin all the excitement for seeing Darby in this shock thing by doing the segment out in the truck, where Darby goes and he jumps in the truck so he can take on the guys. And Claudio Castagnoli, like an adult with a child, just picks up Darby and slams him against a wall, not unlike Foghorn Leghorn and the Chicken Hawk, where it's just like he, you almost want him to just set Darby down, pat him on the head, and go back in the truck and drive off. I didn't understand this at all. If we're building up for Orange, why are we continuing to see Darby in this segment? But okay, Darby and Cesaro will fight cool I, I i guess uh any other thoughts before i move on yeah I, I mean i think the death riders not really having clear motivations continues to hurt this uh i the idea we're taking over the tbs superstation they just do a segment they don't even continue to disrupt the rest of the show and this is let's be straight up you look at this card up and down. This is perfect for the Death Riders to screw up every single one of these matches because none yes. of them actually matter. Yes. Not and a single one of these matches actually matters. But pissing off FTR might have some utility down the line in terms of storytelling. Um, you know, going after uh, going after Swerve Strickland, interrupting his match with Leo Rush 
might actually have some utility. Yes. Marina Shafir coming down and beating up Penelope Ford and Britt Baker is more interesting than them having a straight up match. Yes. I, like, I can yeah, I can go continue to go through this card and with the exception of Adam Cole and Roddy Strong where literally there's no amount of charisma that can save them <laughs> I can actually find a way to make all of this more interesting yes the the Jericho segment was fine I, I have no notes for it other than but, but was, even even the Death Riders coming out and beating up the learning tree guys I think I think yes would, they would should be interesting because it's against their ethos yeah it's against yeah. the Death Riders ethos but to get to your point now, we get Britt Baker and Penelope Ford. It was a fine match. I liked the, sure. the say. But what ticked me off, okay, this is how they build feuds now. Somebody wins, somebody comes out to the apron or comes out to the ramp, and that's the next feud. Ta da. So this time it's Serena Deeb. And how does Britt Baker react to this? By yelling, who can't, no one cares or who cares? I forget which one it was, but it was one of those two. And I'm like, if I'm doing a gimmick, like Moxley, where somebody just blows off. Somebody else says, nobody cares, or who cares? The next week, I am killing the character of Britt Baker on television. Right. I mean, you have to, but like this, this to me is kind of like it, like the yes and rule in improv. You can't say, nobody cares, you shouldn't care, This it's dumb to care. Like The one thing a wrestler should never be saying on the microphone yes. is... Ah, you the audience. This is dumb and you shouldn't give a shit about it. Yes, no selling your opponent is not a good idea. No. Ever. You should have some you can reaction. Downplay, you can downplay them. You can say they're a trifle and go, you're just an obstacle in my pathway to the next thing. You you can trifle them, but you you should never signal to the audience that this is boring. Yes, apathy should not be a reaction, even if it's yeah. Marco's stunt coming out. and. <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I mean, I, nothing is worse than, oh, we could have a match, but it'd be boring. Swerve and Leo, they got to do that NXT spot where Leo flips off the apron and Swerve does the dive outside and lands on his feet for, for a nice thing. But uh, overall, this was to just get to the after match where Swerve becomes a dumb baby face who used to be part of a stable, so he knows about people attacking you from behind. And he doesn't realize that Shelton Benjamin's going to attack him. It was fine. It was just one of those things where you're just like, Swerve is a guy who says he's too cool for school. He knows everybody's move. And then he becomes a dumb baby face like every other one. He should have maybe plotted for this if you're going to make him the cool baby face. Type yeah, of yeah, Stone Cold Swerve Strickland should see through this and at least should get the upper hand on the first member of the Hurt Business before getting outnumbered but he should at least be smart enough to know this is what's going on because he's a rattlesnake jamie hater has a has a vignette where she's about to tell us her 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 main purpose or her next move and it's interrupted by a julia hart vignette it's like god just let her get out her purpose and then have julia hart play the vignette or whatever <laughs> but instead it's it's that lazy thing where it's like we can never figure out anybody's motivation because we're always interrupting them for what the next match is gonna be and look the yeah, julia I hart mean, thing is, is like fine the, but yeah th this is like the cutting away at the end of a scene you have like a really emotional scene and you don't know how to end it so you just cut away to action yes yeah, uh, and, and I feel like they a lot of times they don't know how to end these promos, so you just have an interruption. Had the Harley Cameron and Mina Shirakawa exchange, and God bless Harley Cameron because she always comes in with some form of energy for her promo, even if it's ridiculous, and they shook their tits. And uh, you know, I'm going to watch that match because it's going to be five stars, and I won't care. Oh. <laughs> Look, but I mean, look, this was dumb comedy. I was here for the stupid. It was a nice respite from the serious stuff. It's just the stupid stuff shouldn't get over more with me. And then finally, we have uh, FTR and the House of Black. Good match. Perfectly cromulent. Didn't really increase any of the emotion between the two teams because House of Black is now a babyface team, apparently, so they can't be really heelish. But you know what killed this match for me, Chris? Was Private Effing Party, who just a mere two weeks ago were the scrappy underdogs who finally defeated their nemesis, the Young Bucks, and, you know, and, and are now the tag champions and are going on this 
Massive baby face. Nope. We're back to the old private party heel shtick with the velvet rope and the bouncer. And we have to cut back to them every 20 seconds. And Zay going, I thought that was it. I thought that was it. It's like, I don't care about you guys. I want to watch this match. Stop cutting back to these annoying jerks who I think are supposed to still be baby faces, but you're putting massive amounts of heat on by having them being very, very annoying on my television screen every 30 seconds watching this match. If you want them to be excited about the match, put them on, on commentary and have them put over the teams as very, very just good. Just have them sit out on ringside. They don't even have You just cut to them occasionally, and they're just out watching the match at ringside. Oh, I couldn't believe this. I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to enjoy this match, guys. Can you stop cutting to the fourth wall breaking private party talking about, you know, <laughs> I thought that was it. I thought he was done. <laughs> just I'm a baffling episode for me of Dynamite. But I just, I, we have now beat this horse in the ground. Go somewhere else for me, Chris. Okay. Uh, let us. I don't feel like we have to get too deep and probing on this show so we can talk about NXT next here. Okay. Um, you know, I, I here's actually where I'm going to start off with. This will surprise you, but it's like a minor note, but I, I think it's at least an observation worth noting here. I thought Sol Ruka uh, ha, has improved in the ring. And I Cora Jade is not a great match and never an entertaining, you know, opponent or participant in a match for me. Huh. But... Sol Ruka, I thought, for her part of the match, looked really good, really coordinated. I like that she's gotten more comfortable moving around the ring. And I really, the Soul Snatcher is usually a kind of ham-handed move. And I actually thought that the setup that they came up with for the finish with yes. the Soul Snatcher was really cleverly uh, done. And so, yeah, like, I, I didn't think this, I wouldn't go so far as to be like, this is a breakout performance for Sol Ruka. But I do see Im steady improvements out of her. I like, and I, I'm trying to remember from memory, but it felt to me like they were doing less gymnastics spots with her and more wrestling spots with her. But I might be misremembering. But no, I think, I, that's, I, I, that's I think that's always, a fair characterization. But yes. that's always the problem with soul and, and people in that training center is when you get people who are naturally gym, gymnasts, they want them to do lots and lots of gymnastics as opposed to make them do wrestling and fit the gymnastics within it. You know, this is a, a bit of a problem with a uh, Kalani Jordan in some ways. Um, oh, okay. Let, let, let us move now to Kalani here. Shall we Se secret heel Kalani Jordan? Oh, I mean this week it's much harder to make the secret heel argument. It's just, clearly does not understand what a revenge and being pissed off match is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to be worked <laughs> right from the promo to the actual like performance like yeah guys is like not what you should be doing in a they screwed me out of my title i'm gonna have eyes in the back of my head yes i know i can't trust like she came out and gave the absolute wrong performance here some of that stage direction but some of that's just gotta be her trusting her own instincts now, you know this is wrestling <laughs> they're not gonna give you every note to the guitar solo no you've gotta be able to improvise a little bit and understand what's going on in the song I'm, I'm, I'm going to move over to SmackDown real quick because uh, while we're talking about people who have improved, uh, B Fab was in a three way with uh, Bailey and Candice LeRae. And she's been training outside of, of the normal, uh, you know, main roster gigs to try and be better. I thought she looked pretty good. Uh, look, it, it's not any you know four or five star quality thing and she was in there with two two better two two of the best but, but that was a really great way to get her she held her own i thought yeah so no i i, I actually think that it was a very clever way of road testing her too right like you have yeah. candace who's kind of like a trainer coach trainer player coach sort of thing bailey veteran um and they can both be there and coordinate the action and fab can work on her execution and getting over the jitters and feel comfortable that there's people there and there's even downbeats where candace and bailey can do some stuff uh, that's honestly a wonderful 
way for a developing talent to be deployed. I forget what school she's going to. I, th- I want to say it's Booker T's. I, I, I read about it, but but no, she's been taking, I mean, she wants to be a wrestler. She doesn't want to be just a valet and, and, a, and, a, and a spokesperson. So good for her. I thought I thought that was uh, very solid. I'll let you go, go again. So. so my next note here uh, on the Booker T uh, is my new, <laughs> my new favorite thing that Vic does to Booker T to troll him is ask him an open-ended question that requires closely following the text. So he'll say something to Booker T like, hey, Booker, how have metaphor changed over the recent weeks? <laughs> and like a young child forced to do an essay question and just freezing, Booker has to like go through the Booker computer to find some <laughs> sort of phrase to explain how metaphor has changed or at least answer the question so that the sentence has an ending to it. I absolutely adore what Vic does to troll this man. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it reminds me of this. My, my favorite Simpsons joke is uh, <laughs> Bart Simpson's going to do a book report. <laughs> <laughs> Ivanhoe is the story of a Russian farmer and his tool. <laughs> it's like that. It's like you haven't read this book, Booker T. <laughs> don't try and don't try and make up a book report for it. Just well, say- Noam Dar has been injured. Yeah, and <laughs> a- 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 what has that meant for them? And you can just well, they see- haven't had Noam Dar, and he's been kind of their leader. V- Vic, is- Vic is like a uh, a prosecuting attorney. Who knows that the guy he's cross-examining doesn't have a proper alibi or answer. So he sets up the question to make the guy tell a story. And he's just sitting there going, all right, I'm just going to wait. Yeah. And then I'm going to press you on whatever stupid thing comes out of your mouth. Uh, In good storytelling... The past two weeks, this bloodline, reformation for for war games, and then the reveal of the fifth man for the OG for the new bloodline, I thought has been uh, quite inspired. It's hit all the notes. It's look, it's not mind blowing, but sometimes the simplest story is the best. From the from the OG bloodline last week's SmackDown, which hadn't aired before we we recorded reuniting with Sammy and trusting Sammy again to now this week revealing that uh, Bronson Reed is the fifth member of the new bloodline team. And I, you know, I know a lot of people were expecting, you know, a little Kevin Owens Cody thing in here, but I like the fact that Roman reigns in another story is kind of collecting enemies again, because of the whole partnership with Cody, who is also collecting enemies of people that Roman has screwed over (laughs) in a way. And that Cody going into that tag match is the Rosetta stone of all his old friends, hating him again. It's, it's, it's a very, and now Seth Rollins, who is, who says I'll never team with Roman again. Well, now I have a chance to get at him in this cage and Bronson Reed, right? And Bronson Reed. But <laughs> there's going to be that moment where Roman's vulnerable and he'll probably turn into eventually Seth hating Cody as well for being actually being his friend or something. I, uh, I, I love, give me Bronson Reed and Jacob Fatu as a tag team and a run with the tag titles. Have the, I, I don't get me wrong. Ready. I like the mo- I, I like see the- Bronson Reed is just a solo star, man. I, I think he's I got too. everything. I, I, I'm fine with the association with the bloodline, but I want this to end with Bronson Reed getting annoyed with Solo Sokoa and all of them. Well, that would be nice. To, you know what? Yeah. I, I like the idea of Bronson Reed having his own motivations. But he, he's kind of like the he joins the villain group, but he is in himself. Looks I, at, he's looks like himself a as a mob figure boss. to me. Yeah. No, he's like Bane. Bane. Uh, he, good. He, yeah, yeah, he's big, he's muscular, but smart and calculating. Yes. A lot like, uh, I think I used the t- uh, Blockbuster, another Batman villain who became super smart, but it was also a hulking brute, but had brains and stuff. Yeah, I uh, I had it like this. I'm, 
I, I, I'm hoping on Monday that Seth rejects the offer at first. Cause it's like, look, I don't want to, I don't want to team with Roman. You know, I can get, I can get Bronson Reed on my own time. And then he's eventually going to have to be talked into it. And I assume it's going to be a beat down by the bloodline. And yeah, I was going to say, it's going to be just Bronson Reed attacking him. And that'll be, that'll be, that'll be fine yeah. too. I am, I'm yeah. perfectly happy with that. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more, but I, I kind of do like the new coat of paint on Miz. I, I know Miz is such a flake anyways. And look, this this Wyatt Six thing, meh for the most part. But but I do like I I did like kind of the uh, kind of the it was all a setup thing for Miz, and of course we knew it would probably will be. But but I liked the way that it was executed. I thought it was very well done. And look, I I Miz is not going to take away from Karrion Cross just being awesome throughout this whole thing because Karrion Cross has acting chops, kids, and I can't explain it, but I will watch him in. In every scene, it feels like he's free balling it, but he's probably just really comfortable with the material. And I, I really, en- I've really enjoyed this Karrion Cross run a lot. I, I like Karrion Cross characterization a lot. I like Mrs. Being broken away from our truth. Our truth is just a land of diminishing returns for me every time he's brought in, with the exception of the Judgment Day. Where he was, when he's slotted perfectly, he gives you, every, he just kind of gives you a steady output, right? But when he's overcast, like with the Miz and R Truth, it becomes overbearing very quickly. It's overbearing if they do him every week. Yeah. But if you get, occasionally get the story in there, and then occasionally he snaps out of this, because I I'm still very uncomfortable with the the quote unquote dumb black guy. Yeah, um, I, I really yeah. am, but. And there are times where his jokes land, you know, like like, like when he calls, but when he's he calls like Butch oblivious Pete. to the yeah. point of not being intelligent. Yes, that and that's my problem too. It's like yeah. you, you can't see that what's gonna what's about to happen to you. You know, you can be because he's kind of their version of Jimmy Valiant in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jimmy Valiant was always, you know vicious in his offense but it was also once he got beat down you'd get angry jimmy valiant and i'm gonna take revenge on you jimmy valiant i'm not the happy dancing lovable goofball anymore i i can flip the switch and go into something else i i just yeah i if if you do it every week it's like it's like watching a a wrestler and i'm i hate to say this because i'm gonna bring him up but like adam cole who to me doesn't have, I mean, he, he does good matches, but if you watch his matches every week, they become much the same. I, I think our truth as a presence every week doing the same dumb jokes every week. Gets and then that stay. results in the same sort of by the numbers match. And I get that Ron Killings is, you know, at around 50 at this point. So I'm not expecting him to do hyper athletic matches. No. What I'm asking for is different stories and yes. being clever. Like, you know, Christian Cage does this a lot and rod killings is one of the most athletic men for his age that we've ever seen perform so i know he is completely capable of still telling us really good stories in the ring and working clever and doing more and i feel like this character hamstrings that too and I'm, i'm gonna end my my lazy river notes on this i love the spot and i'm howling at this fact but the only reason EO Sky is in this War Games match is to do the trash can off of the top of the cage, right? Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> it's almost like the Undertaker streak at this point. Now every year we have to find a way to get EO into the War Games. Uh, happy Dakota Kai's back. I always think she's she's a good presence with the damage control kids. But uh, yeah. I, I, I thought she was turning on them with the way she did this promo. So maybe that was just a bad delivery. I You know what? I, I'll have to go back and rewatch it. But it, she there's always that chance, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> now, now that she's kind of become the Paul Orndorff of the women's division because she just goes back and forth between babyface and heel. Like, like water, but uh, I have nothing else. Do you have anything else? Um, I, you know, once again, we Javon Evans and Lexus <laughs> King have like this weird convergence, and like the Lexus King story is weird. Although, I actually think with Brian Pillman Jr., they have something and they figured out something that AEW is never able to figure out with this guy, and he's becoming 
like a bit of like a screen presence. Uh, he's he's got the charisma, if not the athleticism per se. Um, and then Javon Evans, I I just I continue to be flummoxed by what they think the developmental plan is <laughs> for this young man, because the things that he needs to develop on. They're not really giving him any form to develop on. No. He needs a character, and he needs to learn how to work and grow into that character. And right now they got him as Mr. Bouncy. And, like, that doesn't teach him to do his stylized offense. It doesn't teach him to edit and omit and stylize the offense that he's paring down to. It doesn't teach him how to do a promo. And he ends up just kind of being a guy – who is a guy who is not Wesley, nor is Cedric Alexander, but is also on the roster too. He, he he's it's that ricochet run towards the end of his uh, end of his WWE run where it's just hey here's the athletic guy we'll put up against other athletic guys to get a couple of cool high spot. And he's turning into Evan Bourne. I was about to say Evan Bourne too. Yeah, but, uh, but I, it's just like weird to like bring that in as developmental. Uh, it, it's kind of my thought. And then obviously I, I we got a couple more notes since you, you're out here. Um, well, well, I want to, uh, I want to go back to Alexis King real quick. Yeah, please. I like Brian Pillman jr. Overall. I think this is miscasting. I don't think we need a, I don't want to be my father storyline to get him to be a big baby face. I think he is perfectly situated to be a heel and I don't need a redemption story. I think he's situated to do either. He he is just like naturally charismatic, and it's funny because he literally he was not good at promos four or five years ago. No, he was not. He was terrible at promos. He was terrible, and now he's not. He's definitively not bad at them. They just keep giving him weird scenes to try to act out, and I'm actually I find myself impressed with his growth because he's acting his way through these scenes that are frankly effing weird no it, it's because he has, a, he, has a, he has mixed motives if you gave him a motive where okay be good or be bad but it, instead it's be the bad guy who's pretending to be good type of a thing and you can but then he's not it. actually right you think that or like be ambiguous be ambiguous is, yes. yeah right yeah i think he's actually gonna shake out to be a good guy i think this is a face that's turn. fine yeah let but no i think it's a yeah. weird it's weird i i would just let him go out there and connect with the crowd i, I would too talk about brian pillman uh yeah i i don't think you need uh you don't need to run and i hide think part him. of the problem though is i mean <laughs> it's so funny because if you watch his father when his father was a baby face absolute crap promo Yep. Could could not cut a promo just because because it's hard to be a good guy. It really is in wrestling, and and to have the baby face come out and you know fire up the crowd. And, hey, I'm fighting for you guys, and, and because we're so cynical anyway. Ah, screw you, you know Dudley Do Right. Go in, and then they have to turn all their baby faces heel. It, it's one of those things where it's like I I liked him as a I liked the Lexus King heel run a lot i don't see why you need to turn him to be honest with you but okay if we're going to turn him let's go all the way but let's also figure out an ethos for him so that yeah. he's not lame no no I, I you know what i i I would actually have him be the cool baby face as in one of the reasons heels hate this guy is that he's actually cool and that everyone thinks he's cool and he's like not like cool like Ashanti the Adonis where he's like overdoing it on the women or anything like that. Like, <laughs> like he's cool. And like the sense that like people actually just like talking with him. So like he's, women class, are, he's class president. Cool. Yeah. Really, like, like, like women are comfortable around him and kind of think he's attractive. The dudes all like Lexus King. Cause like, you know, he likes good music and has cool cars and like is actually a chill dude. And every so often people think that like, oh, he's an asshole because he wears a leather jacket or whatever, but he turns out to be a really nice guy, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, like, he's not trying to be he's not trying to be yeah. the, the, the alpha dog. He's just a guy that people like. Yeah, he's just a cool dude. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Like I that that I actually think would work. And then yeah, you have him come out there and have his matches and stuff. But like I, I would like an Ethan Page would be a perfect foil for a just nice, cool guy sort of thing because Ethan Page thinks he's cool and is actually like a prick. He'd be the Frank Grimes to that. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, no, on it, the, Ethan Page versus that character would be like absolutely Frank Grimes. Why do you people like him? I don't understand this. Dude. 
Uh, he's Lexus is just nice, dude. He, he's just a he's cool got, guy. He's got a cool car. I don't he's, know. He's he's, he's chill. Cool. Yeah. You're so up. You're so upset right now, Ethan. Dude. Heck, Ethan or Lexus King would never get this upset over something like yeah. that. <laughs> Lexus would say something funny about this. <laughs> yeah, he'd cut the tension with a nice joke. Yeah. Uh, the rest of your notes. Uh, Andre Chase and Rich Holland as the build up to Trick Williams. Is no. there? Oh my God. Less blood could not be found in a vampire's den. <laughs> yeah, I just we we've, we've already had the ambulance match. How do we? Uh, okay, right. I, I, and I mean, everybody's you know, expecting weird. Ridge Holland to win this. There's no. I know. I actually think Andre Chase should win this if we just move Ridge Holland the hell on. <laughs> well, you I, so want to you so want to get rid of Ridge Holland off of this well, roster. Okay, so the, the alternative is we're liquidating Chase U. Yeah. What? Poor Riley Osborne. Poor Duke Hudson. <laughs> Thea Hill will be fine, but Riley Osborne's been at this university for years and hasn't gotten any credits whatsoever. <laughs> He's the eighth year senior. <laughs> Chase U. Riley, I want to talk to you about your degree plan. You currently have zero credits completed towards anything. Well, I'm still trying to decide my major. I was a sociology major at first, but now I'm thinking poli-sci might be the way to go. Uh, yeah, but you just keep dropping the courses before the end of ad drop period, Riley. <laughs> zero point zero. <laughs> uh, anything else? Um, no, I mean, I think that was, that was the, the only other thing, uh, Nikita Lyons <laughs> turning heel, I think is a positive development, but then to have Adriana Rizzo come back with a crowbar and knock her out was idiotic. Yes. I think a new ruthless Nikita Lyons needs to not just beat Rizzo, but beat the hell out of Rizzo. I agree. Uh, <laughs> People are going to be finally relieved that they don't have to cheer Nikita Lyons anymore. But uh, yeah, I, I think she's going to, I think she, boy, she does have that ability to make people angry, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, and I think she's a good heel. Yeah, I do. I think, she, I think she works as a heel. She's she's a scary presence. Yes. Especially, I would have Especially her. with the knee braces. I would use that. I would use the knee braces. Like she does a leg drop with a knee brace. I I would actually have her do like two on one squash matches against very small developmental talent and have her use the knee brace on one of them and that one's just like wrecked on the ground <laughs> holding their ribs as the other one gets annihilated. Yeah, the problem is it would be Nikita Lyons doing it. And I don't think we want Nikita Lyons doing that necessarily, but uh Vader Club this week, it was my pick. I found a lovely gem on Daily Motion. Uh Vader and Great Coquina. Versus Shinya Hashimoto and Masa Saito going into two of my favorite things, meat matches, and for some reason, the Masa Saito babyface run that I've never watched before because I am still fascinated by this thing. Great Kokina, this is early, early Yokozuna. He has not gained all of the weight yet. Uh, I remember him from his AWA run as Kokina Maximus, but um, a very svelte and very... Uh, Agile, I would say, great Kokina in this match. Vader is Vader. And hey, he's, in, he's in great condition. This is like, you know, like 89, 90 Vader. So, you know, yeah. he's he's I'm, in great shape. Oh, both are in great shape. And the yeah. tags are quick. The, 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 the ring is smaller than, than your average WWE ring, which is always the issue with me with tag matches. Like, if you watch tag matches in territories... That ring is small, and those and those tags come a lot quicker, especially when you have big guys in there that can just go over there and and tag them. And it makes tag team wrestling a lot more fluid. Um, <laughs> Masa Saito just chops the crap out of Vader and Greg Okina at one point, and I'm just like, dude, you are getting an education right now from this man. <laughs> I like Masa Saito is a really fun baby face uh he's big and like but like you know he he's big so when he's in there against these monsters he still feels like he's got a chance but then like both great coquina I, I just want to keep calling him yoko Let's like call both him yoko if you yeah, want yeah yeah both both yoko and vader like are 
that much bigger than him that this this remains a really good big baby faces versus even bigger heels man yes because saito is i mean he's a i like to call he's like a muscle hamster i mean he is just he, i mean he's a square he is jacked to the gills dude that that his upper torso yes it's just like pure muscle it's crazy and it's it's one of those things where I am so used to watching him lose and sell for bigger baby faces on the WWF roster that that this continues to be a revelation for me in terms of the fire up spot that he does in this match where and the crowd starts going nuts for him. I'm just like, what am I watching right? This is awesome. And I, I love that it's all built around him. Like he like you said, he is jacked from the waist up, just a, a granite, but this whole thing is about him trying to slam the bigger dudes and trying to pick up the bigger dudes, and sometimes oh, he fails. Oh, but that slam on Yoko. Oh, he yes. It, uh, and he backed up, and he's at the side of the ring, and he, uh, the facials are there. Like he, Yes. He has he has that charisma, He's selling man. emotion. He's selling, yeah. like, 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 I think it was the, it might have been the Yoko spot, but there were, I, and I was seeing it to the, the Yoko or the Vader spot where he tries to pick him up, and he fails that first time, and he backs up, and he kind of gives that quizzical look and he gets kind of angry at himself. And, no, I'm going to try this again. And then he does it the second time. I go, oh my God, that's so simple and so great. And then the belt, and this all revolves around him getting a belly to back suplex and, and a three. And it's like that, that was, these guys are dropping each other on their heads. I'm sorry. <laughs> these are not, these are not your clean belly to back suplexes. This is picking a guy up and dumping him and then getting the three. I, I adored. This is not a five star classic by any means, but it's a but it's a hose me classic for for Jeff Hawkins because it's just big meaty men smacking meat. I adore. Yeah, no. Every, every time they hit, they hit, they hit with authority and power, and like that is really kind of the hallmark of what we like here. And, and Vader and Coquina are so young in their careers at this point; like they don't really know what they're doing. But you can see that you know. <laughs> I forget. I think it was oh, it was like Vader just absolutely kills uh, Hashimoto's face at one time. I think that how did he get the bloody Jesus. nose, bloody lip? I, I, I'm I'm watching the matches that I want to do right now. I'm actually in the Hashimoto spots, and he just like quarters of this that backhand. Yes, it, it, it might also have just been like that kind of vader lariat that he yes, does so that he yeah. misses sometimes by yeah, punching well, in, yeah. the face. In, in, in this case he just basically like gets him with the forearm and elbow i, th I mean yeah no i hashimoto gets waylaid a oh, bunch he, dude he i mean I, I was watching just his face and it's starting to swell oh. up because he's been punched in it like at least three times by baby vader because vader doesn't know what he's doing quite yet and, and you know and great coquina is not exactly working you know <laughs> he, he's not exactly working light let's put it that way kind of yeah. mean like the like the throw out of the rope spots for from these guys it, that's something I've noticed about all these muscle guys in the in the early '90s. It's like even getting thrown out of the ropes feels like an adventure because you might you might break your neck on the way out because these guys are just throwing you at such velocity and you're going along with it to sell it. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's on Daily Motion. I highly suggest uh, seeking it out. Any other notes on this match you want to bring up? Uh, no, I I just I mean I think. Masa Saito is, I, I really have a new appreciation for Masa Saito in this match. Uh, one other little, like, small note, because this wouldn't be in your notes at all. They, he does this really great tag to Hashimoto um, in terms of, like, smaller, like, micro-psychology, where he, he's gotten the upper hand on Greg Kokina. Kokina tags to Vader. Vader's coming with a sense of urgency, like, uh-oh, Saito's kind of firing up. I got to kind of slow him down a little bit. And Saito grabs Vader, locks up with him, brings him into the corner, and does the behind-the-back tag to yes. Hashimoto. Yeah. I, I love, I that. love like, those spots. Stuff like that, I love that, man. I love that spot. I love the we lock up, and I can't get the upper hand on it, so I let go, and I back into my own corner for a moment to kind of regroup and kind of chat with my partner type of yep. a thing. I, I, I just love those little things about tag team wrestling that people don't do anymore because it's more of the performance part of it versus the working part of it right 
And it's and, the your turn, my turn, and we use the tag to give each other breaks. Yeah. Rather than the tag being an important part of the story. Right. Who's in, what we're doing right now. Now you're gonna come in and you're gonna retake oh, you know, now now yeah. you're gonna come in. We're trying we're trying to double fi- figure out a way to double team this guy to get an advantage type of thing versus oh, it's your turn to do all of your high spots and get the crowd into this match finally. That that's the difference to me in this. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I just, both teams have a method to their madness, and, and I think that that makes, that makes this match, and, and like, just these older style of tag matches, I, more gratifying than, for example, Cage and Page, where the only real story during that match this week was, can Cage and Page coexist? Yeah. I uh, yeah I, I I do love the old '80s and '90s tag matches. They are fantastic. We'll cut it off there. This has been Shake Them Ropes. I am Jeff Hawkins. He is Chris Novembrino. You can follow me on social media at x at crap game thirteen. You can also just follow the show at Shake Them Ropes. That's where I will post Vader Club highlights if uh, if I get them in early enough, or if or if Chris gets them into me early enough, I'll post them there. And then I also just post the show over there as well. If you just want to follow the show. Chris is only on the gram right now. He is at D-O-C-T-O-R underscore N-O-V. I do a show over on Fight Game Media called The Dynamite Show about 20 minutes after show. Wrestling Observers <coughs> Paul Fontaine and I go live on YouTube. Drops into the free audio feed the next day. Thorough deconstruction of that Wednesday night's Dynamite. Hope you can join us this next week. Chris is Chris has made a banner about music lessons. He may give a phone number out. I don't know if he's going to, but he might. <laughs> well, I mean, if you go to the Instagram, you're going to find my phone number. So it's not some grand mystery. And I don't know. It, it's weird, I think, to have a public facing accounts. And, you know, I, public I facing saw that and I was like, that's intriguing. And that's so unlike Chris. But I guess because it's near a school. Right. No, no. Okay. No. Yeah, no, okay, so, like, literally where that sign is next to is the driveway to the entryway of the school that all of the parents necessarily have ah. to drive into every single morning. So, I, I, they're already coming down the street that I live on. The school is physically right next door to me, and the street that they're turning onto where that sign is is the entryway for drop off for the kids. Hmm. So I'm just getting, I'm basically getting that advertisement in front of hundreds of parents every single day. And Christmas is coming up. So remember, people, you want guitar lessons. Let's say, hypothetically, there's someone in your life that you love. Wouldn't that be swell? I think a swell <laughs> way to say that you love them if they like music is to give them the gift of music. And what better way to do that than through music lessons with your old pal, Novi. Hit me up on Instagram. My Instagram is D-O-C-T-O-R underscore N-O-V. Chris Novembrino is my name-o. And keep on reaching for those stars. And if there's someone you hate, get them drumming lessons. <laughs> yeah. If you really hate them, book them for 90 minutes with me and see how that goes. We...